Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon Dawn book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is podcast episode 111, Heaven and Earth, season 3, episode 10. Hello! Wow! We are screaming toward the end of season three. I cannot believe it's gotten this far in to 10 episodes. I am looking forward to the Drums of Autumn read-along that comes after, but this is going by far too quickly for my taste. This week's episode was written by Luke Schellis and directed by David Moore. And my apologies if I mispronounce anybody's name. I try my best. (laughs) So according to stars, the synopsis is Claire races to discover the source of an epidemic aboard a disease stricken ship before hundreds of sailors die. And as Jamie locks horns with Captain Rains, Fergus finds himself torn between loyalty and love. Hmm. But my summary goes something like this. Due to the typhoid outbreak, Claire is pressed into service aboard the porpoise. Fergus is a romantic. The porpoise sets sail. Jamie loses his mind at the captain for not pursuing the ship and winds up in the brig. Claire gets a keen helper and turns the porpoise into a floating hospital. Fergus refuses to help my lord escape. Jamie is frantic and angry and once again vomiting. Claire finds patient zero. Claire meets goat lady. Claire learns an arrest will be made. Claire threatens a man. Claire's first escape is foiled. Jamie is an utter arse to Fergus. Fergus still refuses to help with the cockamamie scheme. Claire loses helper. Marsley has a plan to free Jamie. Jamie gets his blessing for the marriage. Claire escapes. Jesus H. Roosevelt Christ, she escapes. Well, that about sums up the episode. There's a lot that happens in between there. And this is really heavily Claire driven, which I like. We did not get to see her act as a doctor virtually at all in the 1960s. Those episodes really surrounded her and Frank's relationship but we really never got to see her in action except in little tiny snippets that weren't altogether meaningful. So I'm really glad to see her putting her skills to the test and doing what she does best, which is heal people, or at least try to contain disease (laughs) and to figure out where it started. Jamie is pretty ancillary in this episode. We see him and some Fergus, a little bit of Marsley and the other people, but really the Artemis doesn't virtually exist. It seems to be more of an afterthought, but I'm certain they didn't want us to not know what Jamie was doing in the days that Claire was on the porpoise. So we don't know exactly how much time has gone by for Claire during this episode, but it has to be a decent amount of time, probably a couple of weeks, I guess, to a few weeks. I'm not sure how far they were from land when she ended up getting taken by Captain Leonard. Oh, now one of the things that struck me as well that was odd in this episode is that Claire is pretty calm and cool until she loses her crap once, really loses it. But Jamie is just like he's lost his mind. He reminds me of a T-Rex stomping through everything and smashing it. And he's chewing scenery. It's so over the top. I'm not quite sure what to do with that yet. Maybe by the end of the episode, I will have an idea. (laughs) So I'm going to look at Jamie's stuff first. 
because it's so little. And then we can focus on what Claire did. So we start out with Jamie being really vigilant. He's watching the porpoise and he's sharpening his dirk. You know, you always have to be battle ready or fight ready. And then the cook, Aloysius Murphy, goes by the horseshoe and touches it. And all I can think is, enough with the horseshoe already. I mean, they beat us last week with that horseshoe and the superstitions. We really don't need to see any more of it at all. We discover that since Fergus cannot give a posy to Marsley, that he has a potpourri sachet made for her. And then Q, oh, it's so sweet. <laughs> New love. And Jamie, instead of looking at Fergus, like what a nice thing to do for Marsley, because Jamie obviously loves her because the girls were the reason he married Leary ultimately, is to be a dad, that he would think it was all about him. And I wrote, dude, Jamie, it's not all about you. Like, is Fergus really trying to impress Jamie with that? Probably not. I mean, it could be like Marsley was trying to butter Claire up about the bunk. But I don't know. That seems like a stretch to me. And then Jamie notices that the porpoise is leaving. Bye bye porpoise. And this is where he's like a T-Rex, stomping and thrashing and chewing all the scenery. And for some reason, he thinks he's the captain and he's trying to give all these orders. Since when did Jamie become an expert about ships? He has a job. He's the supercargo, which means he oversees the cargo getting on the ship. He oversees it getting off the ship. He oversees it being sold. Like, he has a pertinent job, but not while they're actually at sea. So he's on the ship with nothing to do. And then he decides to tell him how fast he needs to go, and the captain is not having any of it. He's not your bitch, Jamie, at all. And the captain has every right to do what he needs to do. And he had every right to allow the other ship to keep Claire. They're sick men. It's a military vessel. And who is he to say no? And they're meeting up in Jamaica anyway. No big deal, right? Sure. So then Jamie decides in his better judgment that he's going to assault the captain for real. And I put my penis, uh, my weapon is bigger than yours because all of a sudden there's guns and knives and dirks and yeah, because Jamie grabs the captain. So clearly after assaulting the captain, Jamie's going to end up in the brig. There he goes. And a couple of side notes. Why is Hayes in every single deck shot? Maybe they're making the most of him since he didn't die last episode. <laughs> and I wondered, what is the sail made out of? Is it silk? I don't know. If you know, please tell me. That's one thing I didn't look up for this episode. So next time we see Jamie, he is vomiting profusely. He's very sick. It looks like he has a rat's nest on his head. And this whole episode reminds me of the hours after a huge party when people have taken in far too much drink. And then he goes on this thing about all the men on the ship and she's the only woman. Really? She's there being the doctor. The captain is overseeing her and giving her all this power. Do you think the men are going to hurt her in this situation? Half of them are sick. A whole bunch of them have died. There's not many of them left. And I think he reeks of desperation and vomit at this point. And then he goes into this stupid plan about commandeering the ship and taking it to chase after Claire. They're already behind the other ship by at least a day. I'm like, that's a stupid ass plan. Go back to your bucket. Insert eye roll. He's like, he's so over the top. 
And Fergus is not buying it either. Fergus is trying to be just even and steady and just telling him, no, this is not going to work. Jamie wants him to steal the keys to get him out. Fergus says no. Mm -mm. And I wrote down, this is painful. Cool your tits, Jamie. <laughs> and then he tells Fergus he doesn't know what love is. And that he would do the same thing to go after Marsley in one hot minute. If the same thing happened. He's really being an ass. And Fergus is still saying no and Fergus is right I also wrote your pain doesn't mean you get to be mean and awful to Fergus and then he tries to make a bargain by saying that he'll give a blessing if Fergus lets him out of here really Jamie just stop just stop get a hold of your bucket and go sit in the corner and throw up yeah didn't like it. It seems so out of character for him to have that level of desperation and really being obnoxious to Fergus. And coming up with such a plan, uh-huh, because you're going to captain the ship. I mean, I know he learns very quickly, but all those men are not his men. And he would have to throw half of them overboard. And then he wouldn't have enough crew to run the ship. Ugh. Not liking that very much. We see Marsley and Fergus interacting. And she's cleaning his stump. And puts his hand back on, the fake hand. And I wrote down, who's the whore now, Marsley? Who's the whore? <laughs> Because she and Fergus start kissing and making out, and he stops her. It's pretty hot, though. They've got chemistry, I have to say. But he says he wants to wait till they're married. That's it. And she says he's just like Jamie. When he gives his word, he will not go back on it. And Jamie's the same way. And then Fergus's clothes are all off kilter, and Marsley had tried to get his breeks off. And so he turns, and he's leaving the room the birth, and I wrote down, better make sure the flag is down before you're walking about, Fergus. The other guys are going to notice. <laughs> and then we see Jamie next, where he has the photos. It's really sweet. We don't know how much they were talking about Brianna because we haven't seen it much. We didn't even know if he had the photos because we only saw him grabbing the cameo from the print shop when it was on fire. So I'm glad to see that he has it. And he seems more calm now and more himself than he has the rest of the episode. Marsley hatches a plan to get Jamie out. So she seems to be the most rational of all this episode. Even in trying to jump Fergus's bones. She was right. Jamie was contained and Claire's on some other ship, so who would know? <laughs> and she says if he gives his word to the captain that he won't retaliate or rebel, they'll let him out. And she gets in Jamie's face. And I wrote, your word will set you free. And Jamie's being a bit of a whiner here. I'm like, stop. Stop. So he gets out of the brig. And we see Fergus and Marcelli together, and the captain wants them up top quickly because he needs all hands on deck. And he finally gives their blessing, and he thanks Fergus. Because Fergus was thinking clearly where Jamie was being, frankly, he was being a maniac and reactionary. Jamie is not normally rash. He may come up with some crazy plans sometimes, but they're well thought out. He was having a bad day, including a bad hair day <laughs> or days. How many of her days it had been? We don't know. But he gave the blessing so they could be married by a priest and all is well. We finally got there. Okay. That's all there was with Fergus, Marcelli, Jamie, the Artemis. Not a lot this episode. 
Thankfully, Jamie came to his senses. At first, I thought Fergus would do anything for Jamie. But then on the second viewing, it would make sense that he would be very cautious and make sure of what he's doing first. They've been together for 20 years since, since Fergus was 10 years old. And he would know Jamie almost better than anybody else. And he saw that this was not a good plan and it was safer to keep Jamie locked up for all of them. So what about Claire? So Claire decides to get down to business. The decks are all being cleaned, like so clean you could almost eat off of them. I know, gross. <laughs> and the sounds of the ill men, ugh, it's pretty bad. It sounds like people have had way too much to drink and they're all vomiting. And it looks like there's actual diarrhea on the floor, but according to Claire, it's mostly vomit. <laughs> she says that when she's being questioned as to her authority for what she's doing. And sweet Elias Pound is the best assistant anyone could have. I mean, didn't you just fall in love with him immediately, right away from the first shot? So non-book readers, what did you think of Elias Pound? Did you love him? Was he credible to you? And I wrote, Elias Pound, that's right, you tell him. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. He may be young, but he's an officer. And he's been aboard ship for many years. Claire is a bucket of grog. And grog is basically watered down alcohol that is given. That way if it's cut, the men aren't going to get as drunk, but they still have their alcohol and everybody's happy. But it lasts longer too. So inside the notes that go with the show, whether you're listening through iTunes or elsewhere, there are links that go to different areas and one is about grog and we have I have a link for you to learn all more about typhoid and about what Claire would have done from Outlander Medicine and several others as well for your viewing pleasure because I always like to know the details just like in the read-alongs what else we're looking at so the cook isn't happy about the grog rations going down anyway it's just gonna get worse from here and then Claire yells at sweet Elias because he puts his hands in his mouth after dipping them in the grog, which is likely rum and water. I really just want to put Mr. Pound in my pocket and take him home. <laughs> I want to be his mummy. Actually, I'm old enough to be his granny, but he's so sweet. So Claire explains about contaminants. And what's interesting is that she doesn't explain everything to him. She doesn't sit down for 20 minutes and give him a little class on contamination and how everything is processed and how this particular disease works. She's telling him things along the way, which I don't think is very effective, frankly. But we're getting to see Claire under pressure, and this is the Claire that we love. She has that way of being in charge and doing her job and even men who aren't used to having women tell them what to do will listen to her because of the authoritative nature she has. And that comes from her being in the military first and then being in medical school and being a surgeon. So she's in high contrast to Jamie. She's pretty calm and cool and she's doing her job. It's difficult, but she's doing it. Unlike Jamie, who was losing his mind until the end of the episode. And Elias is such a good helper and he's a quick study and he gets extra brownie points, right? Because there's some Scots on board who were in the toll booth in Edinburgh who know how to distill alcohol. So they build a, dis a distillation equipment and take the grog and turn it into purified alcohol. 
Now, the thing about this that's really scary is that the men can't drink it or they could die from alcohol poisoning because it's very much stronger. So now the grog rations have to be reduced even more. And the cook is angry and he's suspicious of Claire and he doesn't like it at all. He acquiesces, but he doesn't want to. And I wrote down that Claire is playing a game of would you rather with the cook? Would you rather the men die? <laughs> How many of the men would you like me to save? Yes. And what I thought was funny was, and rude, was the cook called the Scots whores. He called them slags. It's a British term for whore. So there you go. Everybody's a whore. <laughs> Except Claire. She didn't get called a whore this episode. Go figure. Of all the people, she didn't. <laughs> so Elias again comes to her support and aid, and Claire looks smug. Because she keeps going back at it with the cook. And as they have this purified alcohol now, and she dips her hands in it, I can feel them cracking as the alcohol dries on her skin. In reality, she would have had been chapped and cracked and bleeding. She would have had to put some kind of salve on her hands because there was, wasn't gloves. She didn't have any. And she every time she entered the sick area or left, she had to put her hands in that alcohol, as did everyone. So then she instructs Elias even more on the ways of contamination management. Again, she should have done it before he completely started working with her. And she said not to touch his face or his hair or his clothing because he could transmit the illness. But it's okay to touch the sick while they're in there as long as he re-dips his hands. They have this really sweet connection. Is it because she's missing Brianna or it's because she sees this boy's heart and his willingness to learn? I think she would have wanted to take him with her if she could. We learn that he's only 14. He's a wee bairny. 14. And he's been on ship for half his life. That's why he's so good and confident. We see that his friend Jim Quigley, who's from the same town, succumbed to the illness. And it's very hard for Elias. As grown up as he seems, this is his friend. Claire is at the top of the epidemic where still the ink with the incubation period, the sick are still coming in. She has to find the typhoid Mary. Like she's overwhelmed. It is not getting better yet. And it has to get worse before it can get better. So she goes in search of that patient zero. And with the help of the captain and going through all the logs, by the way, the script in the log books is stunningly beautiful, and I wonder who wrote it out. Could, could be a font, and those pages were printed, but I have no idea. It looks like somebody who has a gorgeous, steady hand wrote it out. And they find the one man who's not dead amongst all these people who he was messing with. A mess is where you eat. And he turns out he's now working in the galley and he's spreading it silently. In the Outlander Medicines link at the bottom of the write up, it says, Learn about more. It says, Learn more about typhoid and click there. She goes into the whole thing about ty typhoid Mary and how she was a silent carrier and was actually imprisoned because she went back to doing work with food where she got people sick and they died. So he's a silent carrier and the cook does not like it. Claire takes him and puts him in a holding area just so they can get everything contained and he can't make anyone else sick. So as long as he doesn't work in food, He's likely not going to contaminate anyone else in the future. He needs to stay away from that. Because there's really no curing him of being a carrier. 
And I did say on here, at least the cook didn't call her a whore too. <laughs> but they have been using the name Fraser. And I'm thinking, why did they use their real name? Jamie is called Fraser. Claire has been called Fraser. I'm dumbfounded by this. Jamie left Scotland in a heap of trouble. And though it takes a while for communication to cross, why in the world would he use his real name and not use an alias? <laughs> I mean, perhaps only the captain needed to know what his real name was. Nobody else on that ship had to. So it's time to bury at sea the dead men. And I think that the friend looks like Giovanni Rabisi. <laughs> like he could be his cousin or something. <laughs> and we see the dark side of nasal piercing. It's really quite beautiful to watch the method and the practice of shrouding the bodies, wrapping them, and then sewing them. And they put the last part through the nose to make sure that the person was really dead. And it was supposed to be done by a friend. And young Elias Pound did that for his friend who died. Claire is getting utterly worn down. It's hard work. Do we even know if she's sleeping at all? And then we see the entire ship of men on deck and Claire and they're going to be doing the burials at sea. Anybody else recite the Lord's Prayer with Captain Leonard? I did and I looked it up and they did use the prayer that was in common usage at that time period. It has changed over the years and the language has been modified but that was the Protestant version. So there's a link in the write-up for that. There's so many different ones. And going back to 1,000, 1,100, it's fascinating. And I really liked that Claire joined in. Last episode, we saw Jamie praying and cross himself as Claire met him on deck under that big moon. And Claire joined in here. We know that she's not very religious, but it meant something that's powerful. I was surprised she didn't cross herself, though, because she was Catholic, brought up and married to Frank, who's Catholic, and married to Jamie, who's Catholic. So that surprised me a little bit. But maybe it's because she was amongst Protestants she didn't. I don't know. So the cook goes out of his way. There's obviously a rivalry between them, at least according to him. He's having a fight with Claire, whether or not she knows it. And he's just the sticker in her shoe that she can't get out, the pebble. He comes up to her and he completely rags on her. He's such an a-hole and telling her that there's still men dying. And what is she doing? Boiling water and washing hands. And the way he said doctor, I expected Doctor Who to show up. <laughs> Bing, right there on the deck. And so Elias comes to her aid again and quashes Cook Cosworth, like pound sand, buddy. And Claire gets all smug again and looks at him like what he said. <laughs> like she didn't really feel threatened by him. And she wasn't going to do anything to him, but he was very rude to her. And book readers, I know, I know, I know you're expecting somebody to be showing up during this episode. And he's not here right now. It's okay. It's okay. So she talks to Elias about how to professionally manage the disappointments and the tragedies and the difficulties of the job in order to continue working. And I think that was really well done. It's that professional detachment, and she called it 
compartmentalizing where if everything was right in the front, right on your sleeve, you could never work. It would be too difficult when things happen that don't go the way you want. And sweetly, Elias gives her his rabbit foot that his now deceased mother gave him before he went on his first ship with his uncle. So rabbits are the theme of this season. I'm surprised people aren't having babies. <laughs> There's that really nice bond between Elias and Claire. It's so lovely. Is it because she's missing Brianna? Is it because of his skill? I don't know. It's really wonderful, though. And they hit it off. Even though she could be his granny, too. <laughs> so somebody else is taken ill. It's Corporal Johansson. And we get to meet Annika. I am yelled, Annika, Annika, which is what I said. So I pronounced it wrong. It's Annika. And... We get to meet the goat lady. Love her so much. And she's this presence. And she's just glows. So her dumbass husband drank the pure alcohol. And Claire, her cool, has left the boat. Like she just went ballistic. And she was cussing. And Elias just stood there looking at her. And then she apologizes. <laughs> And he said he just had never heard words like that from a gentlewoman. Claire says, I'm no gentlewoman. <laughs> Claire collects herself really quickly. She was able to rein herself in and reset. This was all the pressures, all the losses, all the feeling overwhelmed, like she has no traction against this disease. And she turns and thanks Annika for the goat's milk because they're keeping men alive with it and to yes have her continue to do that work as Claire is leaving she spies a Portuguese flag and she's wondering if the porpoise had come across the Bruja well she goes searching for an answer and she enters the captain's office and he's not there and so she starts digging through the log, trying to find out what ship it was. Well, it wasn't the Bruja. And she notices an entry with very damning information about Jamie, that it's a trap. She's going to be used as bait, that they know who he is. And he was recognized by, by some guy named Tompkins. Who's Tompkins, you might ask? Oh, we're going to get to him in a minute. So the cook, Cosworth, the pebble in Claire's shoe, comes in getting something for the captain. And he threatens her, and then she threatens him that she's going to do a scream that he attacked her on the table. Like, really, a fake rape scream. Ugh. This is why people don't believe women. Why was this put in here? Could she not have come up with something better than that ridiculous fallback? Ugh. That was the only thing I did not like about Claire this whole episode was that moment. Oh, she could do better. So somehow they resolved that. But really, like the cook is not going to go tell Leonard that he found Claire going through his ship's logs? Huh. He definitely was going to go back because he's angry at her and doesn't trust her. We see poor Elias looking terrible. He had spent all night with Corporal Johansson, making sure he didn't die from the alcohol poisoning. He was starting to look really terrible. She's crafting a plan, and we wonder who Tompkins is. Well, she gets the crew to find him, and it happens to be the one-eyed man who worked for Percival in Edinburgh and who fought with young Ian and the print shop burnt down. He's the one who found the seditious materials. 
Dun, dun, dun. And so Claire gets a bone saw out, and I'm thinking it's getting a little shop of horrors up in here. But the guy is a death wish. Ian threw the hot metal on his face and burned him, so now he's more disfigured than just having one eye blown out. And he thought he was going to get himself a promotion when he discovers in a cask of creme de uh-oh the excise man's body. So he goes on this monologue about what's going to happen to Jamie, that he's a traitor, it's a trap, he's going to be hanged when they get to Jamaica. And Claire is really upset and she's getting mad and teary-eyed like most of us women do. When we get really mad, we cry. Maybe it's so we don't start freaking out and screaming. I don't know why we do it, but most of us do. So Claire decides instead of killing the guy that she says that he's a second carrier of the disease like Howard. And she puts him down in the hold across from Howard and then menacingly tells him that he better stay away because Howard really is the source of the disease. <laughs> so it was better than her harming him. That was the best threat ever. But it doesn't matter. All these things are in motion for Jamie to get caught. Why Claire goes back to Annika, I'm not clear in this episode. Maybe she was going to check on Annika's husband, who now wasn't there. He's better. But she went down there and starts telling her that she's worried about her husband and he's going to get arrested and she has to warn him. And Annika understands and speaks just enough English. And she's completely an ally. And I think she's grateful to Claire for making sure that her husband is okay. And for thanking her for the milk. And she says, my goats needs grass. And Claire has no idea what she means. Huh. But thanks her and goes along her way. So the epidemic now is contained. So all the people who can get sick have... And happiness returns to the episode and the men are singing and playing music above. And I put a link in for the song that they're singing. And Claire is excited and wants to go find Elias. And she's so happy to find him. And then, no... And she reaches for him and he's covered in sores and he's gray and she knows he's not going to make it. He's the last person to become ill with the disease. And he looks at her and says, Mother? I'm like, I don't even, I don't even know how I'm not crying right now because with the viewings I did, I cried. I needed tissues and had to blow my nose and Whatever. No, you ugly cried. <laughs> so did I. Ugh. So hard. So hard to say goodbye to Elias Pound. Sweet 14-year-old with a heart of gold and would have been a great surgeon given the opportunity. And Claire does the stitch through his nose in order to send him on his way to his water burial. Oh, he's one of my favorite characters, even though he has such a short role. It's sort of like Annika. There are characters that stick, have always stuck with me. When I think of the side characters, they're, they're always at the top of the list. There's something so just exceptional about both of them. So Claire is at the rail. It's hard on her. And I know book fans, I know, I know, again, you're expecting somebody to show up who didn't show up. It's not him either. It's the captain coming to talk to her and thanking her. We'll see where this is going because those lines didn't really get left out. We get to hear about the hardship of the work and how to function and really Elias gave Claire her props and told her what a good job she did and that it wasn't a miracle, it was her, right? It was her skill that caused 
the shift to happen. Otherwise, the whole ship would have been lost because Howard would have continued to work in the galley and they all would have fallen ill eventually. So land is near, we find. And it's not Jamaica, but it's Grand Turks. And they're going to have to take the goats for grass because they need to be able to milk them still. And that's the only way the goats can stay healthy. So they're going for fresh water and to feed the goats. So Claire is with Annika, and they have a plan for Claire to escape. And Claire is hauling booty across the island when she runs into... Captain Leonard and a couple of the soldiers and she's foiled absolutely right <laughs> and he tells her that he has to report her husband and he's so grateful for her service but there's nothing else he can do and sends Claire back to the ship freely but she was accidentally got lost <laughs> so she can't get off now but another opportunity comes. Annika comes to Claire and tells her she needs to jump. She has to go to the land. She has to warn her husband. She has to go now or she's not going to get off the ship. I mean, Annika picked up right where Elias left off, supporting Claire and helping her. Claire could not have done this by herself, any of it. It was too big. She needed to have that assistant. So there's some barrels. She has Claire take her clothes off down to her shift, but she still kept that damn bum roll on. Maybe it will help her float. I don't know. So they wrap up all her clothes, tie it to the casks, I guess, and she and Claire heft it up to the side of the ship, and Claire does not want to jump. She thinks she's going to drown. This really scares her. It is big ship. I love the water and I could totally jump off the side of a boat. I've jumped off the side of small boats. Um, this would terrify me. <laughs> so Claire climbs up on the side and she has, they throw the casks over. So it's a raft. And then she says, Jesus H Roosevelt Christ. And she jumps and the music is high and it's wonderful. Right? So Claire, escapes after listening to Annika. And Annika also gave her money in case she needed to secure a ship. So who were the heroes of this episode? Well, besides Claire's mad skills, it was Elias Pound, Fergus, and Annika. Clearly to me. Jamie was like Godzilla stomping around and burning down Tokyo until he finally got his head straight. Claire jumps, Jamie is freed, Marsley and Fergus get the blessing. But what about the one-eyed man that Claire had put below? How will Claire warn Jamie? How will she get to shore? <laughs> There's so much involved here. I love that we got to see Claire in her element. I wish we'd have gotten to see a more sane Jamie. Trying to come up with a better plan. Or even sticking him in the hold so he couldn't commandeer the men, that was fine. But I did not enjoy his portrayal this week very much until the end. But he still had that air of, well, you're trying to impress me. And you need to prove to me. Mm, really? You've given your blessing. Move on. And his irrationality was too much for me. I wonder what you guys think. Do you like how that was played? Does it make sense for Jamie that he would flip out, that she would be away from him, and he's worried about losing her again? Here's the thing. He doesn't know that they know who he is and that he's going to be hanged in Jamaica. And yes, Jamie's a quick study, but the fact that he wanted to commandeer the boat, basically mutiny, to go chase after Claire. You think he would have come up with something a little bit more plausible. I don't know. I liked the foil of the cook to Claire. It was terrible for her. He didn't like her at all. I really hope we get to see 
a little bit of Aloysius Murphy. I mean, we got to see Cosworth on the porpoise, but we have had virtually no attention paid to Aloysius except him touching that stupid horseshoe this episode. And when Fergus was being iced by Fergus and was, was thinking about getting the keys to unlock Jamie, the captain was all poo-pooing the superstition thing. Lassies are not good for being on the ship. They're bad luck. So even the captain was tired of hearing about it, apparently. We didn't see any of Yi Chen Cho this episode. I mean, he was in it, but he didn't say anything in the very beginning when they discovered the porpoise was leaving. So there's some things that we have to deal with now. <laughs> so they need to resolve Jamie being wanted and that log book getting turned in and becoming knowledge to the English legal system as a whole. We need to deal with Claire getting to shore properly and safe, safely. How are they going to meet up? What is that going to look like? Because again, just because you read the books doesn't mean we have any idea what the heck is going to happen. Different universe, similar, but not the same. So some things were like, oh, great. Like I was so happy to see Annika that I cheered. <laughs> and I didn't know if she was going to be in it, though. There could have been another way. I figured she probably would be when they brought up the milk and biscuit gruel stuff they made for the sick men that we would see the goat lady because she's awesome and all that. But we didn't see a key figure in this episode that everybody expected to see. So now I actually got a question today of somebody wondering if we're going to see that character in Jamaica at all. What do you guys think? We've seen Claire and Jamie kind of in a redux of their French clothing. There's been some pictures. So we know that there's some kind of reception in Jamaica that they have to get all fancified for. But is it with that particular character? Hmm. We don't know. We don't even know if there was that precious cargo on the porpoise at all. So when the script comes up tomorrow, which is Monday, on Star's website, read through it and let me know if that particular person was supposed to be here or not. So what did you think about this episode? I Like I said, most of it I really liked. I didn't even mind Jamie having to get put in the hold and locked up during the episode. I just didn't like how he was too Godzilla or T-Rex-like for me. I mean, it seemed out of character that he would be that unkind to Fergus and that overwrought. But hey, what do I know? I'm not an actor, never could be. Ever. It's just, it's not my thing at all. I always laugh and say, I have the personality for radio, hence podcasting. I should not be on any sort of video or television. Not at all. So we have all these things that we have to deal with. And we still have to find young Ian, right? That's the whole purpose of this, being on the ships, going to toward the West Indies is to find his nephew. And we did see in previews that he's there. And now we get to get to that part of the adventure soon. So I wonder what Claire will find on this island when she does get there. Hmm. So the overriding thought is that everybody who has watched the episode early loves Elias Pound. They said he was amazing, and a lot of people cried for him, too. People are wondering if that special person is going to be showing up on Jamaica. We don't know. And Kitorino thought the episode was boring. She didn't get it. She didn't like the way Jamie was portrayed in this and didn't understand the dynamic between him and Fergus. 
like me, Nedra Hale thought that Jamie's interactions with Fergus were out of character and so did Catherine R. Sven Wessip thought he was irrational but everybody loved Claire and how she did in her own element and I like I said I totally agreed with that so Diana is going to be taking over and answering questions for Sony slash stars under hashtag ask Diana. So if you listen to this the night of the official airing, send her questions that you have. Overall, I liked the episode because most of it was Claire's work and I'm glad we get to see her. I cannot say enough about how much I've missed seeing her in her true space because we just don't and it's strange to see Jamie so melodramatic that does not make the king of men <laughs> his actions and his comportment and his reasons for doing things are what make him the king of men because he's willing to do things that nobody else is because it's right. So I hope we get to see his balance come back. And maybe he was just so off settled because, or unsettled, because he's worried that she's not going to come back. And that's based on his insecurities last episode. Maybe that's part of the problem. I'm not sure. I have to see how the rest goes together. Sam is an incredible actor. This has more to do with direction than anything else. And what feel they were all going for. But it was a bit lost in translation this week. I loved Caesar Dumboy and Lauren. She's an amazing Marsley and they have excellent chemistry, which I'm really glad to see. So where can you find A Dram of Outlander? AdramofOutlander.com On Facebook, A Dram of Outlander page and group. You have to ask to join the group. And there's a few questions to answer to make sure that you're a real person and not a bot or a troll. So please answer the questions. On Twitter and Instagram, it's Dram of Outlander without the A in the beginning. You can call the listener line at 719-425-9444 and leave a voicemail, comment, question, how you're feeling, suggestions. Go on over there. You can email me at contact at adramofoutlander.com and I will answer any questions you have there. And I ask for you to please support the podcast. What does that look like? Well, you can go on to iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, whatever your streaming service is that you're listening to the podcast through, and leave me a review that will help bring people my way. You can share the podcast. Tell other people about it. Go on to the Facebook page and group or Twitter or Instagram and join into the conversation. Share it with other people so they can come and join too. You will find that the people who are on the group or the page or the other social media are amazing. You guys are overall really respectful to each other. You don't have to agree at all on points. And yet you can remain kind and decent and have actual discourse. So that tells me that you all are very bright <laughs> and you're very likable people as well. So thank you for being such excellent participants in the places a dram of Outlander is. And you can also financially support the podcast. Because I'm a one woman show, I do everything myself and run everything and pay for it myself. <laughs> There's no subsidy. So if you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash outlander and for as little as a dollar a month, you can help me bring the podcast to you and others. 
If you'd like to make a one-time offering, just shoot me an email or voicemail and we can discuss. And remember, Wednesday nights, it's the Dram of Outlander chat on Twitter and we use the hashtag ADOO, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and we talk about the prior week's episode in detail. It is so fun and you guys come up with things that I would never think of. And I love that because I try to think of everything and there's no way possible. I'm only me. But I appreciate you and I thank you for making the podcast a success. Without you, there's no reason for me to do it. And I'm the only single podcaster out there for Outlander. So your interactions are very meaningful to me because I do this all by myself. And without your feedback... I have no idea how I'm doing, <laughs> so please let me know. I would like you to tell me what you want more of, less of. Hey, if you'd like to come and be a guest on the show, shoot me a voicemail or email. If you make an Outlander-inspired product that is not copyrighted by Sony, let me know. We can do a giveaway. I'm always looking for things to bring to you guys. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, Slange va.